So hi everyone, uh, it's my privilege really to be uh, introducing our speakers today, but we will start with a land acknowledgement. I'd like to um, acknowledge that Queens is situated on traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee uh, territories. We're grateful to be able to live, learn, and play on these uh, lands. So today we have two seminars, two people who you should all know. Uh, we have Dr. Zihang Lu and Wei Tu. Uh, so the first seminar, Dr. Liu, will be identifying longitudinal respiratory phenotypes in child cohort, uh, C-H-I-L-D, uh, a machine learning approach. So Dr. Liu, for those who don't know, are, is a biostatistician and an assistant professor in, here in our department. He completed both his master's and his PhD at the University of Toronto in biostatistics. Uh, his research program is developed at Sorry. His research program is to develop and apply innovative statistical machine learning approaches to analyze health data and complex structures. His research is supported by NSERC, CIHR, and the Canadian Statistics uh, Science Institute. So that's Dr. Liu. And then Wei Tu, which is over there, um, his presentation is uh, titled Machine Learning Based Predictive Modeling and Risk Factor Identification with applications to HIV. Uh, Dr. Chu is an assistant professor also in our department and also a senior biostatistician for uh, the Canadian Cancer Trials Group. He completed his master's and his PhD in statistics at the University of Alberta, and his research lies at the intersection of cancer, trial, uh, cancer clinical trials and emerging data science, and his research entrance uh, also includes uh, dimensionality reductions, quantile regression, and data privacy and interpretable uh, machine learning. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Okay. And thank you, Dr. Saeed, for the introduction. And I'm very grateful to have this opportunity to talk about my research and share some of my interests as well. And in today's presentations, I'm hoping to talk a bit about uh, one of the projects that I'm recently involved in, in terms of uh, identifying longitudinal respiratory phenotypes in a Canadian birth cohort study using a machine learning approach. And with this goal in mind, uh, sorry, me, I'm hoping to get started with giving you a very broad overview of my research interests. Then I'll talk about the trial cohort study as a Canadian birth cohort study. I'm hoping to talk about two questions of interest. Why do we want to identify phenotypes in a child cohort study? And how do we identify phenotypes using machine learning approach? And I want to also share some of the results and findings. And finally, I'll talk a bit about the summary and some of the ongoing work related to uh, this project. So broadly speaking, um, developing new and innovative statistical and machine learning approach, or in general data science methodologies, lies at the core of my research programs. And this will include developing new methods for analyzing complex health data. And at the same time, I'm also very interested in developing efficient computational algorithms and software packages as a way to disseminating our methods and approach, but also as a way to be producing our results and findings. And all of this work, I highly motivated by my involvement in terms of the health and interdisciplinary research, where I collaborate with uh, researchers from different fields and uh, areas to, uh, such as uh, clinicians and epidemiologists and computer science uh, scientists on varieties of projects. And most recently, uh, my work has been mostly focusing on uh, using unsupervised methods to uh, disaggregate disease heterogeneities to uncover disease phenotypes, uh, also performing risk predictions and causal inference using different types of data, such as the cohort data or electronic health record data. And ultimately, I'm hoping that this kind of efforts and research could contribute to improving the patient's care and also improving the population health and health systems performance. And one of the studies that I heavily involved over the last several years is the Canadian Healthy Infant Longitudinal Development Cohort Study, 
also known as the child cohort study. And this is actually one of the largest birth cohort study in Canada these days, which is based on a general population. And the original goals of this study was trying to help us to better understand the gene environments and their interactions in the early life and how does that affect or lead to the developments of allergy and asthma diseases. And in this cohort study, over 3,500 pregnant women were recruited during 2009 and 12, and across four different sites of Canada, including Vancouver, Edmonton, Winnipeg, and Toronto. And being able to involve in these studies allowed me with an of opportunity to analyze different types of data, including, for example, the genetic data, the pollution data, and uh, the microbiome data, the lung function data that collected through the clinical visits. And because of the rich longitudinal data that collected throughout this longitudinal study, now it becomes a major platform for studying the developmental origins of health and disease, and also as a platform for studying the precision health, particularly the precision medicine. So with the trial cohort study, one of the study interests that I have been collaborating and working on is how do we use machine learning or statistical learning approach to understand early determinants and developments of asthma, particularly in early life. Now, you know that asthma is a major chronic respiratory disease that affects many or millions of people worldwide. And it is also known that asthma, it is a heterogeneous group of disorders that potentially with many different phenotypes. And this heterogeneity is further complicated in preschool children, because in this age range, there's not many, uh, there's no case, uh, gold standard case definitions in preschool uh, asthma. And because of this, uh, we lack the solid basis to develop a treatment, particularly targeted treatment and interventions in these age groups of children. So one way to get around this is to appropriately identify early life respiratory phenotypes, which will help us to serve as a foundation to identify high risk children and potentially also predict long term outcomes such as uh, COPD in their later life. And it also serves as the evidence for us to identify endotype, which is associated with the underlying disease mechanisms leading to potentially uh, personalized medicines or treatments. So from methodical perspectives, one of the questions that I'm quite interested in is how do we appropriately integrate this rich longitudinal data that collected over time particularly in the trial cohort study or other large data platform in order to have a better understanding of the underlying disease development trajectory and predict future outcomes. For example, in our trial cohort study, a wide variety of variables that were collected over time, such as from the questionnaire, from the test or from the biological samples. For example, in the questionnaire, we collect the mother's health data, the mother's psychosocial variables, father's health data and child health data, also the social economy status. And these variables are collected prenatal periods and also postnatal periods up to 60 months of age. And right now, I think we are at the eight year and 30 years of visits as well. So potentially more data are being collected ongoing in an ongoing efforts. So, if we are able to appropriately model these different types of longitudinal data, potentially using unsupervised learning approach, we may have a better understanding of the disease phenotypes that could lead to different risks of the diseases as well. So this is one of the hypotheses that I put up uh, on a uh, project that we're hoping that this kind of integrations of the multiple longitudinal feature could help us to discover new respiratory phenotypes or perhaps refine the existing respiratory phenotypes. And if we are able to appropriately identify these distinct phenotypes, they are likely also associated with environmental and genetic factors, and also clinical and biological outcomes. 
So in order to proceed with the second stage of the analysis, and most recently, we are linking the uh, trial cohort participant to the CANOE database. So the CANOE here is standing for Canadian Urban Environmental Health Research Consortium, which house a variety of outdoor exposure data, such as the PM2.5 data, uh, ozone data, and uh, the NO2 data, as well as the social determinant variables as well. So let's take a look at simple examples that in this, uh, where we are interested in integrating these two dimensional features, the weeds and atopic sensitizations to define asthma phenotypes in early life. So uh, the, the, the reasons that I'm choosing these variables of interest is that they are both important variables that could potentially contribute to the developments of allergy and asthma diseases. And more specifically, uh, the WIS data is collected over time from three months to 60 months of age through parents' report questionnaire after the children were born. And the atopic sensitization data is defined as child being sensitizing to either inhalants or food allergens. And these data were collected through clinical visits uh, based on the clinical assessments at one year or 12 months, three years, or six years, uh, six, uh, 60 months of age. And by the time of 60 months of age, we have one of the primary, uh, primary outcomes of inches, which is the uh, physician diagnosis of asthma uh, as uh, one of the, uh, our outcome to be associated with. So in this analysis, we are considering about 3,000 individuals which contribute to 28,000 observations because potentially each single individual will have multiple observations for each of these two features. So you expect that every, everybody will have multiple observations entering this analysis as well. So to perform clustering or to perform a phenotype discovery, here we are implementing one of the commonly used methods. Here specifically is called group-based multi-trajectory modeling. And it is actually a type of method for modeling longitudinal latent class analysis, uh, which is used for uh, uncover the trajectory patterns of multiple features. For example, conceptually, if you have a population potentially with different growth patterns over time, in this case, a method uh, using a latent class uh, analysis could help you to identify these different longitudinal growth patterns over time. So for example, in this case, uh, a pattern that is identified is increasing and decreasing, or uh, perhaps normalities in this case. And another reason that we're using this approach is that it helps us to account for different type of data, uh, particularly in this case, it's multiple categorical features, with and atopic yes and no answer. And it also does not require the features to have identical uh, numbers of measurements or, uh, or measure at identical time points. So uh, these are one of the flexible methods that can be used to uh, analyzing such kind of data. And we choose to uh, the numbers of clusters or the numbers of phenotypes based on the Bayesian information criteria, which is one of the ways to assess the model performance under different numbers of clusters. I will be happy to talk more about the details of these methods if you are interested. But for now, let me share some of the results from the trial cohort study. So when applying to these two dimensions, weeds and atopic, we are able to identify six distinct growth patterns or phenotypes. There are a lot of lines here, but let me try to get into some of the uh, detail or interpretations of what does this mean. So you can see here, the y-axis here is the proportion or you can understand it as the probabilities of reason. So we have two dimensions here, weeds and atopic sensitizations. So representing these distinct growth patterns over the first 60, 60 months of age. And we provide a name for each of these phenotypes. And more specifically, let's look at these two phenotypes of inches. For example, this green line here, 
is representing a group of children that does not have much reason over the first 60 months of age, which account for about 63% of the entire population in our cohort study. And you can also see that the same group of children does not have much observation uh, probabilities of atopic sensitization either. So that is why we call this group as infrequent weeds and infrequent atopics. So another group of interest here is this golden line, which we call intermediate onset weeds with persistent atopic. And because in these groups, you can see is that uh, the, the children are actually start um, having a reason sometimes during the first years, uh, first five years of age. And they're having a persistent with uh, atopic sensitization over time. And that's how we keep the name. But in these groups, only 3.3% of the entire populations. Now let's take a closer look at what does this group means if we associate with some of the outcomes of inches. For example, physician diagnosed with asthma at five years of age. And you can see here, uh, infrequent wheezing and infrequent atopic sensitizations would have about 0.5% of individuals develop asthma at five years of age. But if you look at the other group here, that is about more than a half children within that group that will potentially have asthma. And that also speaks to the condition and the granularities that we obtain through disaggregating this uh, individual into different subgroups for potentially linking to different risks of phenotype, uh, risks uh, risk of disease. And here is another way to look at the differences uh, between these different phenotypes as well. And what we call this polar plot, where we're trying to look at different dimensions of the variables and compare across these different phenotypes. And again, let's just take a look at these two phenotypes of inches. And in the groups of infrequent weeds and infrequent atopic sensitizations, you can see that emergence group visits is about 4.7%. That is indicating at least one episode of visits uh, during the first five years of age. And in this group of children, that is about 84% of children would have at least one ER visit. And we're also looking at many other factors, uh, including uh, demographics, biological outcome, clinical outcomes, uh, family uh, histories of asthma and allergies. I'm not going to get to the details of these figures, but it's mainly as a visualization tool to help you look at the shape of the distribution among different factors. And if you're interested, I'm can, uh, we can get back later uh, on this figure uh, to talk about the specific uh, factors. And we're also looking at um, some of the regression approach, just trying to adjust some of the confounding factors and lead to uh, more precise estimates of some of the variables of interest. And let's take the first variable here as an example, child sex. And this is the adjusted odds ratio with 95% confident interval. The star here is indicating whether it's significant or not after multiple comparison adjustments. So if you take a look at this as an example, you can see the odds ratio is about 2.56, indicating that being male, is more likely or 2.56 more likely to be assigned to these intermediate onset weeds with persistent atopic as compared to assigning to this intermediate on, uh, in, in frequent weeds, in frequent atopics as a reference group. And we also see some association in terms of other variables such as BMI and maternal histories of asthma and allergies. And how does the results compare if we only just look at one single feature, such as weeds? So recently we looked at a latent class analysis just based on weeds. And there are four different phenotypes or patterns that were identified. For example, persistent weeds over time, over the first six years, uh, 60 months of age, and infrequent weeds in this case, which is the green line here. Now, if you take a look at the comparisons of the cluster memberships between just looking at these, which is the cluster membership here, or 
weeds and atopics, which we have additional dimensions adding in. You can see, for example, the infrequent weeds groups of children were further disaggregated into these two groups. One is with infrequent weeds with persistent atopic, and the other group is infrequent weeds with infrequent atopic. So you have more refined cluster if you're able to add in additional dimension, uh, particularly longitudinal feature in this case. And you will see is that uh, another example here is the intermediate onset weeds was also further disaggregated into two dimensions, which is one of these have a lesser uh, association with the uh, uh, asthma and the other is more severe in this case, 50, indicating 56% of individuals within that group will develop asthma at that time point. So just to summarize, uh, I'm hoping to convince you that being able to integrate a multidimensional longitudinal feature in this case, will be able to generate some new respiratory phenotypes that could potentially associate with um, biological, genetic, and environmental risk factors. And these will serve as the evidence for facilitating the predicting the long-term outcome and promoting the understandings of uh, some of the uh, underlying disease mechanisms. And we're still working on validating these results in a different cohort, but also associate with this newly developed phenotype to microbiome data and trying to see the abundance of a certain species in uh, these different clusters that we identify. And from a methodological point of view, it will be also interesting to integrate more and high dimensional feature potentially to understand uh, or refine these phenotypes. And speaking of these, recently we also de developed some new methods on analyzing multidimensional longitudinal features. And we're still working on using these new methods and packages to understand um, these phenotypes in the child cohort study, potentially comparing different methods. And finally, I wanted to thank my collaborators who have been tremendously supportive in this uh, project, helping me mainly with understanding the questions and also um, interpreting, interpreting the results as well. And thank you so much for your attention. If you have to take any questions. Go to the question at the end. Or, or, or. Oh, okay. Sorry. I, I was just letting you go. Oh, sorry. I have a question. Okay. Um, so, um, Dr. Lu, can you tell us some of the challenges that you face when designing or conducting the study? So, designing uh, the actual defining the phenotype. Yes, thank you so much. I think this is a good question. I think one of the challenges is mainly from uh, uh, how do we appropriately analyze this type of data? Because as you, I, I, I described, it's longitudinal features collected over multiple time points, but also these two features is not collected at identical time points. And how do we appropriately account for this uh, data structure, but also how do we appropriately interpret the result? Choosing the appropriate methods is one of the challenges that I would try to solve. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, I think Hanko did an introduction as well as some very sophisticated methodology in longitudinal data analysis. So uh, I'm talking about, you know, talk about something very simple, probably. <laughs> um, to, uh, I am, anyway, um, so I'm Wei. If I, I joined around the same time as as Zihan and I work primarily at the tri group, but also at here. If you, I teach um, A23 that taught, and I'm going to be teaching the last three weeks of A22. So, best part. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's good for me to take a recently I've been working a big trial. It's always every day is looking at SAS code and, and listing and debug. So, it's good to be here to have a bit of a break. Okay. <laughs> So um, today I'm going to talk about two things. I'm going to talk about, sorry. Okay. 
I'm going to talk about two projects. One project is what one of the earlier projects that I did in PhD, you know, almost one of the first projects I did in the field of machine learning or really power statistics in general. And then the, the last few minutes, I'm talking about something I'm working currently, like a bigger platform. So what is machine learning predictive modeling? It's sort of one of the main thing I want to talk about this talk. And I was like, what should I put here? And I was like, maybe I should ask chat GPT. That might be a good idea. And then, you know, it's a really good answer, I have to say. <laughs> uh, so the key point is, is that here we're trying to you will still hear me if I do this. Yeah. So the key point here is we're using historical data and here statistical algorithms. I'm glad to see that it says this is still statistically even though I mean it's a different field. They're trying to say what is really machine learning or, or data science or AI. And then we're trying to use this process to identify patterns in the data. So really what you want to do is to find out what's happening in your data and how you're going to use this data or this pattern you have to find to make decisions. Uh, it, it, it can be um, supervised, unsupervised, or semi-supervised, depending on the nature of uh, data prediction task. It's not, I mean, it's not super correct in the way that we're doing predictive modeling is often supervised or semi-supervised, but anyway. And you have a training data set to train the data, train the model, and then you usually perform a testing or evaluation or validation on the test data set. So it's all good, and then see, actually very good. Um, but of course, this, if you heard about it, is based on a lot of data, a lot of very sophisticated methodology, and a lot of, a lot of training. But what are the different, one question I keep getting asked people are saying, you know, what are the differences between machine learning sounds so fancy and advanced, whether it's whatever we have talking statistics or whatever, I, you know, quantitative course that you have ever taken, so what do you guys think? Um, what do you think are the difference? Or what, what the, the words, keywords that come to your mind? Marketing. Marketing. <laughs> Business, right? <laughs> Anything else? Self-correcting. Self-correcting, like iterative process, right? Yeah. Anything else? Automation. Automation, that's a really good part. So again, I asked you. <laughs> Chat and GPT gave you these. Yeah. <laughs> they, they know. And I was like, 280 characters. I don't want you to write an essay for me. It's something short. <laughs> so really the main thing, I think one thing is a lot of the algorithms here are H2 processes. So it's kind of different than the uh, more traditional stats model that we have a very assumption based and a very mathematical model based. So these ones tend to be a little bit more flexible, a little bit more uh, accommodating in a sense that it could be uh, applied to a larger data set with different type of structure. But in essence, I mean, what's the difference? It's something on a different scale. Um, so I'm gonna first talk about one, the project I did earlier, very simple, almost very, I, for A23, the final project we did, ask students to write a project based on the campus data set. This work is almost the same level as that. So some of the students did a really good job and, and this, but anyway. Um, so for this paper, we're trying to predict a thing called peripheral neuropathy in uh, HID type one, patient with HID type one using a machine learning approach. So the question we're trying to answer is which factors that we've collected are related we're trying to stay away from the word causal or risk factor because <laughs> we're not doing that. We're just purely correlation of predictive nature for peripheral neuropathy. So peripheral neuropathy, I'll call it PMP in this talk, it's pretty much based on my limited understanding, it's damage to the, to the, uh, the signals between CNS and other parts of the body. So often results in numbness in your hand, in your, in your, in your, in your leg foot and, and other disability. And it's also often associated with uh, a neural pain and physical disabilities. And it's also, there are a lot of other comorbidities such as diabetes that would also uh, influence this. So it's, it's the problems of, of this in HIV, there's a different cohort 
is often, I think, about 10 to 20 percent. In our study, is about 20, 24 um, percent. And we also know that typically uh, patients that are uh, older and have uh, taking some of the earlier toxic drugs are more likely to do all of this. So anyway, the factors we have collected are very complex and uh, the data we have are collected from the Southern Alberta HIV clinic. So basically the patients were invited to enroll and when they enrolled, we basically did the testing, the testing for the outcome. So the testing were done by a bunch of factors, but it were done by a physician. And then we also collected a lot of data probably same time. So the designs, cross-sectional design, so we didn't really have a cohort. Why well, I use the word repeated as in a way that it's, you know, people were, this were done like six years around. Uh, so there were about 500 patients, prevalence were about 21%. And then we have initially there's about 150 variables and then lots of people missing and other issues. So in the end, we deal with about 70, which can be categorized into three main categories, demographic, a clinical and uh, lab lab testing. So we did some univariate testing in the beginning. Now, first off, which variables are associated with this? And we found out the DMP group tend to be older, more female. Uh, basically, it's, you think the sicker patients who have had HIV longer and have worse outcome. And then um, next I did is sort of like, I want to take a look at the data. So what are the differences? Like, you know, have so many variables, 70 variables, what, what kind of patterns are there? So here is a very simple principle components. And you can see, so basically the idea is to project your data into a smaller dimension. So here is a dimension two to visualize where, are, where is everybody. So the solid dots here are the PMP, and these are the NMP, so the normal versus uh, uh, neuropathy. And then you see that there is a difference in this direction so that people in this direction tend to have higher value. So what is this direction? So the box here basically telling you that this direction is uh, so DDC, DDI, D4T are the three D drugs that are quite toxic. And then we also have polypharmacy, which is basically measuring how many drugs you're taking besides the HIV drugs. And then we have HIV erosion. So we kind of see, okay, like these patients are older, has HIV longer and had loss of exposure for these drugs. So, and then you can see there is a difference here, which I kind of like, oh, this, the prediction should be easy because uh, we see a pattern here. Like should, the, the algorithm should do a relatively good job. So next, what we did is just tried a bunch of classifiers, you know, range you from logistic regression to some other type of models. And then there is a little bit of imbalance in the data, it's about 25%. So we did a little bit of uh, oversampling just to make sure that the representation from two groups are similar. And then a little bit of missing data, and then we use cross validation to measure the outcome. So as you can see that uh, all the measures performed better in predicting who, who are normal, but in the case of, not, not case, in predicting neuropathy, uh, it, the performance is worse. And you see that the more sophisticated methods tends to perform a little bit better, but I wouldn't say significantly, like logistic regression did pretty good. Um, so the main results were basically saying, you know, not surprisingly, uh, the, the MP is, is easier to predict because it's about more patients there, but also the patient tends to be more homogeneous. And then um, another thing is that the logistic regression did find out that very similar findings as the univariate analysis that this group is associated with people with more pain, higher viral load, and uh, longer drug exposure and longer HIV duration. And then we did a little bit of more analysis on random forest just because it is relatively more in, in, interpretable as well as it is did a balanced performance in predicting NMP and DMP. So I want you to look at the right side. So on the right side, we have sort of, it's the visualization of which variables are important in the model. And we see that HIV duration is like very much larger than the others and makes us wonder why, why HIV duration is important. So we did, and then another thing is one of the reviewers saying, asking us, can you make sense of the random forest? How do you explain this and things? So what we did is we we used four variables, that is the four of the top variables on the random forest to build a smaller tree, only four variables. And then actually it this is trained on the whole data set, so a little bit of over uh, over training, but 
the results are actually remarkable as in the four variables already produced really good results. As in, if you have HIV duration less than 16 years, the, the chance of predicting your NMP is actually really high. This is the accuracy here. Similarly, that, and, and it kind of makes sense for, for because uh, Dr. Powers, the uh, neurologist here is saying we, you know, when you're thinking about this different leaves, it kind of makes sense, you know, you're looking at the pain and then looking at the viral load as well as with different diabetes. So it's kind of like, oh, this is quite neat. But another thing we did is looking at the HIV duration in more detail, as in what's happening there. So there are the three variables here, HIV duration, the drug use, as well as age. They are kind of affecting each other because we haven't used this drug in a long time. So you can see that here. So basically, a X axis is HIV duration, and you can we're separating them into less than 15 years and longer than 15 years. And you can see that is for patients who have uh, HIV duration less than 15 years, pretty much none of them had this drug use exposure. So in a way that the three variables, the effect of the drug, HIV duration, as well as age on the outcome is very complex. And it wouldn't, I mean, it would be very interesting to, if, project to, to see, you know, what, which is causal relationship and what's the actual relationship there. But anyway, just trying to highlight one of the, the interesting things that I think. And then we also just did a quickly, what's the, the, the two, the two groups seem to be very different in terms of their, their images. But anyway, I'm going to skip this. Just want to talk a little bit about the uh, two minutes. Uh, the project I'm doing right now. So I was invited to do a podcast by Peyton and uh, Tiffany and on, <laughs> uh, um, what's the name of, uh, one app a day or something, public house. Anyway, I think Maria and Duncan has done it, it was fun. Uh, and then I think they asked me a question, what do I think it's one of the important topic or direction of data science? And I said, data collection. <laughs> and the reason is, so here at, uh, I want to say here at CCTG, one of the, for the, we, we did our strategic planning last year and one of the first the three uh, platforms that we're trying to do is data science. And what we mean by that is we collect lots of data. We do trials, we have lots of trial data, but we also collect tons of genomic and lab imaging and all of these data. And we also have trying to connect the ICS data with some of our trial patient data and patient reported outcome. But a lot of times these are set in different places and also uh, the, the access to this data, also the dictionary, the standard, it's very, very much depending on the trial, depending on who's doing it. So in a way that you, in order to, to um, harmonize the, the power of all these data, it's, it's very hard. So the goal of the platform is really three parts, data governance, data standard, and infrastructure. The one thing is we have to think about is do we actually own this data? And a lot of times for trials, you have to secondary use, you have to get another consent, like recently we get Quebec REB asking us to provide second, secondary use consent. So, so a lot of things is about, in the beginning, it's about what data could go into the platform, like which, which, which data can be shared. And we also have a lot of contract issues, companies, which ones can we do? And the other part is standard. A lot right now, between trials, the, the variables and how they were named, how they were measured are quite different. Sometimes you might have people even BSA like could be measured in different ways. And we just, you know, it, and it's like a lot of work to just get these sorted out. And then the last part is sort of infrastructure. How are we gonna collect these from different sites? Because we have so many people, different sites submitting data. How are we gonna store it centrally? And another piece, big part of us to do is sharing because we get lots of sharing requests. And if you do this like case by case, it's a ton of projects. So one of the things we're trying to sort out sort of, you know, giving a big picture is, really for it, I think in order to do data science, you really have to have the data there with high quality with the infrastructure, the, the governance and the, the, the automated processes. And those really takes the time and like thinking through. But anyway, I think I'm already over time. Thank you. I guess you do a little bit of question. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have a question for both speakers. Excellent presentations. 
it seems like your data are letting themselves to clinical um, outcomes. Uh, and, and I like the way of your chart with those, the, those four basic characteristics that, that clinicians could look at and say, you know, is this likely to be? Uh, so is that the goal of this is to take all of this data, distill it down into something? And yours too, Zihang, you've got clinical outcomes, those two A2P and, and wheezing. Yeah, I, I mean, nobody wants model that eventually use hundreds of variables and complex enough, like it just means it's not going to be robust or so I think eventually it's to find those robust markers that could produce useful clinical. The work that you're doing, can you um, do it with, with missing data? Because I think, you know, the longitudinal work that Zhang is doing allows for that. Different levels, for sure. Okay, like, you know, there, um, uh, different levels of sort of accommodating like how much, how much is too much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. For trial, it's also similar things that we are building a database on going, uh, well, which is including a variety of types of data, including the genetics data, the microbiome data that we collect, but also the clinical basic data, such as the pulmonary function data, it will be putting into the, uh, one database. But uh, an extension is also to be able to link this trial cohort data to other type of data, such as the ICS, the administrative database, which is like other type of outcome. I have a question uh, of Jihan about uh, the phenotype. Uh, eventually, cross six group. So, how do you def like uh, find out like uh, it's six or not like five or seven groups of the phenotype? So, in terms of that, determining the number. Yeah. Of yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. For the question. Uh, we use uh, BIC, which is the uh, model selection criteria to determine. Uh, under which numbers of clusters that the model will provide the best fit. And on top of this, uh, I was also using some kinds of bootstrapping to estimate the um, cluster stabilities, such that we resample the data to see each time do this individual being classified into the same clusters or not. So that is the two strategies that I was using for the term here. Yes, Dr. Sahar. There's also Dr. Harris in the back. Oh. Okay. Um, thanks for both the presentations. They're excellent. I've used both those methods before, and I'm asking this purely selfishly. Um, so some of the feedback I've gotten from the latent class models is that how do you evaluate generalizability? How do you evaluate the, the, the validity of these things? So with the machine learning stuff, you have all of those area under the curve and you can do all sorts of accuracy measures but with the latent class stuff you can't do that so how do you address that yeah thank you that's a great point i also got these challenges as well from the viewer <laughs> and also from the question i think um one of the ways that i also mentioned is that you uh, evaluate on a different place or different cohorts and this is also some of the efforts that i'm trying to look at whether other cohort has a similar data so that we can uh, replicate the same analysis but on the same similar population to see if we find similar clusters may not be exactly the cluster but perhaps some of the high-risk children being able to identify in both cohorts and that will uh, some uh, giving us more confidence and on the other hand from the statistical analysis point of view um, one is to evaluate the stabilities of the clusters by perhaps resampling or splitting the data into multiple sections such that we make sure everybody will get classified each time on a different type, on a different subset of the data, and also evaluate the performance of the model. Perhaps these are some of the ways that we can alleviate some uh, the, the, the confidence that these are the true cluster. Are, are there any papers on like using K-full yep. splitting of da data to, to evaluate the I have, uh, I can share one of the okay, papers uh, talking about yeah. evaluating the cluster stabilities okay. in a general cluster analysis, not just this type okay. of data cluster analysis. Thanks. Yeah. A comment and a question. My comment is I'm super happy we hired you. Oh. Both. <laughs> <laughs> super happy. Um, my second, my, my question is, uh, is there, a, I'm interested in how you react to the tension between lumping and splitting or in your answer to Brad's question, how you're getting down to four variables versus this concept which is i think perhaps a questionable concept of precision medicine you know so very individualized 
So, you know, how do you react to that sort of tension that you probably have to react to all the time when you're making decisions about your data? I feel like it's different stages. Like in the beginning, you're trying to find a signal in the haze. So that's why you're trying to find some signal in a big pile of data. That's why a lot of these genetic data, motomic data that we have, because in the beginning, it was hard to have a hypothesis of what, what are really happening, right? So we have collected a lot of these things and trying to identify some of the, the, the genetic biomarker things that are relevant. But then I think in the end, it would have to be, it, for precision medicine, even you have to be like something that's actionable and something that can be tested and can be easily uh, applied, right? So that has to be a parsimonious or a robust one that's been tested. So I think it's for more of a different stages and the, different, uh, the goal, whether it's exploratory or more confirmatory inside. Yeah, I agree with Wei. And building on that, I think it all comes down to how precise that you want the, the, the group to be. Because on one end, it's non-precise. You don't classify people into groups. But on the other end, you can have individualized. Each individual potentially be a groups. But that is not what we want because we getting down to very small sample size. Perhaps we are not able to associate with, with other factors as well. Perhaps sometimes somewhere in between where we have some precision to be able to link it to some of the biological outcome and targeted intervention as well. And sometimes it's a subjective decisions as well. Depends on the data that we have and how precise that we want it to be. Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, it's mainly for you. Uh, with the model that you mentioned, like I get that you've identified Forget if it was four or five phenotypes. He did it across the wheezing and the what the other variables called. But as you add more variables and dimensions, what, what I'm interested in is how you mentioned the model is able to handle um, with this longitudinal data different like observation times. I'm wondering, like as you add more variables, if variables have very different observation times, does the method struggle to identify these phenotypes? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, it depends on what variable, whether your variable is actually a signal or noise. And that is another set of questions. But as you're adding more variables, in fact, your, perhaps your phenotype get more and more smaller and accurate. Um, but in from modeling pers perspectives, uh, this type of model, which is called uh, multi-trajectory model-based methods, you can account for different type of variables as well, such as continuous, categorical, and count data. Does that answer the question? Or? Yeah. Thanks. Thank you very much. Oh, one final yeah. question. <laughs> Thank you for the presentations, Macy. I was looking at Zoom and came back to, have to get some answer for you. Well, actually, I have a lot of questions about the methods because. Uh, I think it's important to get into the details, but can we be in touch to get to get that knowledge from you about the details, particularly uh, for complex diseases that the frequency is very low? How these mo how these techniques perform with that uh, kind of problems? Yeah, yeah, I'd be happy to discuss this in more detail from methods perspectives as well. But a simple, uh, a simple answer for your question is that it does require a large number of sample size and perhaps also frequency to be able to split up. So it depends on what the data looks like and it depends on the, what the model assessments that, that would look like, whether it's the model is reliable or not. So that has to be determined on a case by case basis, but happy to discuss more on that. Yeah. Okay. Okay, let's go right Dr. Liu and Dr. Tu for that uh, presentation. Thank you to Dr. Saeed for introducing the speakers. And uh, I just want to uh, thank everyone for coming and